Welcome. I'm Taylor Marsh, and this is Astral Soul Lightning, a podcast about making meaning, manifestation, and energies we navigate. How we create through archetypes, symbols, spirituality, and our instincts and intuition. Philosophy for the Aquarian Age to spark human imagination. My expertise? The shadow side of human beings. Energies like law of attraction and the intersection of culture, politics, and spirituality. Mars went into Gemini today and will remain in this sign until March 25th, 2023. That's a very long time, so make note of it. My favorite quote about this archetypal energy comes from Astralata on YouTube. Quote, Mars is a jerk in Gemini, end quote. <laughs> Translation, Well, Mars doesn't like constraints or quick wit that dissipates his purpose of action. So if you're going to communicate, make an impact with snark. Have a little humor, be cutting, but always have a little wit attached. From a psychic astrologer on Refinery29.com. Quote, Witty and clever ideas will attract you at this time, as will eclectic people and places. You will be more interested in making contacts and connections and trying new ways of approaching things, even new and different people. Note the retrograde moment of October 30th for Mars, because the energy of this phase, woo, it's a lot different. The title of this podcast, Lilith, Demons, and Mary, encompasses the most important energy archetypes of two women who bookend human history's obsession with judging women to exalt men. This is part one, and part two will be next week. Lilith, Lilith recalls the Greek goddess Athena, whose symbol is an owl. It was associated with wisdom and knowledge. As legend goes, Athena turned a young girl who'd been raped by her father and fled into the forest into her own owl. She'd sit on her shoulder and help Athena see a wider truth. For Lilith, the reference of quote-unquote screech owl at night in written material going back over 3,000 years points, points to a lower status than Athena. But this is only the tip of the contorted characterizations of Lilith that has spanned human history and taken power away from women through her story. It's what happens when men are the only ones respected to write humanity's story. Lilith is currently in cancer until January 2023, which is monumental if you ask me. Our country was born during cancer season, July 4th, although my experience leads me to have more interest in the rising sign of any chart. There's disagreement on America's rising sign, whether it's uh, Sagittarius or Gemini. Let's use Gemini because this calculation came from a 20th century astrologer, which would make Mars placed at the ascendant. Lilith in Cancer is maternal, emotional, loyal, slow to rise to anger, but look out when it comes. Look at the anger of women since Roe was overturned and the uptick in voter interest. The Mars archetype coupled with Gemini for our country, with Lilith in Cancer, hints of comeuppance for people who underestimated the importance of women's freedom over the politicians who want to control us all. This touches the surface of Lilith on a topic rarely discussed. Before I rewrote the Lilith story because of experiences in my life, there was another woman I had to unpack, reclaim, and elevate. The most notorious effort to marginalize a woman's power in history is represented by what so-called Christian men did to Mary Magdalene. Anyone who's read my work is aware of my efforts to reimagine 
religion in a way that elevates Mary Magdalene to the position she earned. It also gives me permission to understand my own gifts. If a heroine goes through these kind of contortions and humiliations, what does a, a woman way down on my level go through to try to tell her truth? Throughout human history, our mythology has been edited, rewritten for new eras. There were many times where women's freedoms were non-existent, but we fought back to regain our independence. This battle hasn't stopped religious men and the women who support them from demonizing our free spirit brilliance, our intuition and imagination, and our ability to commune with God in a way man hasn't figured out. The decision to reimagine the mythology of Lilith and Mary came out of experience and divine practices that led me into uncharted miracles and the meaning of spirit and magic. We begin with Mary Magdalene this week. Part two, again, will encompass exhaustive research I've done on Lilith, experiences I've had, and a, we, and a new way to appreciate her and, and assume her power in a different way. So here we go. Mark 16, 9 through 10 of the new international version of the Bible. When Jesus rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had driven seven demons. Quote. Ah, yes, Mary Magdalene's, quote-unquote, seven demons. But the above text was added by someone other than Mark. So, like most of these ancient texts, literalism becomes a rabbit hole. It's also how originalists cut the wings off of th free thinkers to remove experience as a means of modernizing what faith, religion, and spirituality mean. From BibleWise.com, quote, Luke 8, 1, 2, where it states, 1, quote, And I came to pass afterward that Jesus went, and it came to pass afterward that Jesus went throughout every city and village, preaching and shewing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God, and the twelve were with him, quote, and certain women which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils. End quote. Seems like a riddle, but it's a joke on the readers. The author after Mark sent a signal that the judgment of men against women throughout history was written into holy texts. It was truth. Women continue to battle these indignities, challenges, and the mythology of our shortcomings when compared to males, especially in organized traditional religion. Many religions to this day don't allow women to lead because of the stigma that men are closer to God. The through line in holy text about Mary Magdalene is seven demons. Mystics, mystics thinkers, and scientists know the meaning of this number. Seven is a primary number. The very idea of seven carries mystical importance. By itself, it's complete. No combination multiplied will deliver you to seven. Perhaps the author was sending another message other than Mary's demonic state before Christ, or maybe the writers got Mary of Magdala's story all wrong. A fiction. In tarot, the chariot is associated with the number seven. From Marielle Tarot on the chariot, a snippet from her guidebook, quote, Sevens have always been a magical, shamanistically profound number. It is the number of wandering planets visible to the naked eye. That is, the objects in the sky that move along the great serpentine elliptic. The ancients built their mythologies around these gods in the sky. Plato described the chariot as a metaphor for the soul in three parts, a black horse, a white horse, and the charioteer called reason, end quote. 
Mary's whore mythology was started by the Roman Catholic Church. Pope Gregory I in the 6th century cemented Mary Magdalene's reputation for centuries on one, in one Easter sermon. Roman Catholic theology revolved around Mary Magdalene being a whore through St. Thomas Aquinas and beyond. From, pro, from Pope Gregory I via, via the Smithsonian.com. Quote, she whom Luke calls the sinful woman, whom John calls Mary, we believe to be the Mary from whom seven devils were ejected, according to Mark. And what did these seven devils signify, if not all the vices, end quote? What are the vices? We all know them. The seven, seven deadly sins, pride, greed, lust, envy, gluttony, wrath, sloth. Pope Gregory I continued, quote, It is clear, brothers, that the woman previously used the unguant to perfume her flesh in forbidden acts. What she therefore displayed more scandalously, she was now offering to God in a more praiseworthy manner. She had coveted with earthly eyes, but now through penitence, these are consumed with tears. She displayed her hair to set off her face, but now her hair dries her tears. She had spoken proud things with her mouth, but in kissing the Lord's feet, she now planted her mouth on the Redeemer's feet. For every delight, therefore, she had had in herself, she now immolated herself. She turned the mass of her crimes to virtues in order to serve God entirely in penance. That's from the SmithsonianMag.com. To serve God entirely in penance. Oxford Di Dictionary on Penance is Voluntary Self-Punishment. I'd argue that religious men wanted mortification, as in total embarrassment and humiliation. On another note, the conflation of Mary Magdalene being the woman who was at Jesus' feet has been debunked by, set, by many historians. The assumption that she's the woman at Jesus' feet fit the script men have been dumping on Mary Magdalene since the 4th century. Traditional religion accepts monstrous leaps to support ideology that's much simpler if understood as human mythology, which is reinterpreted with each generation. We are at an inflection point in human history where women will rise to change America and the world. The independence I took in my youth depended on making sense of a faith that was the bedrock of my life, but made no sense to me. I've talked and written about the stealing of women's original faith by men afraid of our divine power that encompasses actual interaction with God's energy. Mary Magdalene's story was shortchanged, and in place of her authentic power, men demeaned her and all women who believed we could talk to God. The quote-unquote dark feminine of Lilith didn't start as a demon. Man's myth-making myth made it so, and women over history couldn't take her power back without retribution or worse. By the way, Lilith's power is not a product only of women, but men too have a side affected by this authentic power which in our era has been replaced by hyper-masculinity driven by fear. Now, the best way to me, for me to share my story is to read a snippet from Citizen Kate, one of the novels in my thriller series, going further with the analysis at the end. Um, but uh, to start off, Dr. Kate Winner is the heroine of my thriller series, and she is a psychic profiler whose power of sight takes her across the veil. She became famous because her authentic power attracted and attracts what she seeks. This is a fictional thriller. The research that backs up the story include my experiences with energy, the mind, and the magic and mysteries 
of psychic phenomenon. This is early in the book, Citizen Kate. She's talking to a group of women. They're working in uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, it is a political thriller, but I promise you there is no partisanship in this. <laughs> Kate hadn't brought the women into her psychic circle because it hadn't been necessary. This had changed when they'd seen her rush out before the meeting had started. Kate had talked about this trigger moment in interviews, so the women recognized it. The room was silent. Kate sat down between two Senate aides at the table. Okay, so let me talk about my process a little. Do you ever have an epiphany on an issue you've been mulling for days? All the women nodded. The aha moment brings clarity. It all comes together. I've heard you speak. You're talking about your gut, right? Said Eileen, the New York senator's chief of staff. Kate held up a finger and nodded. When something triggers your instincts, what we call our gut engages. The beginning of a connection, the energy goes much further. Mysticism and a bit of magic are involved. Sometimes I'm transported into the event I'm seeing unfold in my mind. The women looked at each other. No one spoke. I can become a witness to an event that might happen or has happened. Which one manifests is a surprise. It can also be foreshadowing, a trigger to attract my attention. For instance, I can warn someone about an event that might occur, but what occurs is a surprise in my life. I received the warning, but didn't realize it was for me. I've had this manifest, and it can be <laughs> unpleasant. It can unmoor a person, send you off course, challenges your senses. And better if you're alone when it happens, right? Eileen said. The New York Senator's chief of staff took a chair closer to Kate. You don't get a warning, said Jennifer Zachary, Senator Mike Bollinger's aide. Yes, sometimes, Kate said. I'm often compelled to react because of it. You never told me how it started, Janet said. A grin spread across Kate's face. Simple. The portal for me was the church. It wasn't until later that prayer morphed into something more for me. But how did you discover, I'm not sure how to say this, how did you go from the church to being psychic, Jennifer said. I've not shared these details outside my circle of colleagues. My theory is an anchored in the radical idea of religious interpretation and how Peter and the disciples stole Mary's story. Oh, I can't wait to hear this, Jennifer said. Brianna and the other women lit up. Man invented crucifixion long before Jesus Christ. Let's agree Christ was magnetic, more charismatic than your average rebel. His revolutionary actions, beliefs, and declarations drew attention to himself. So what if through prayer he opened the same portal you or I can tap through meditation or prayer? What's the difference, Jennifer said. There are a lot of definitions, so you must choose what makes sense for you. For me, prayer is tied to traditional and patriarchal religious strictures. Prayer is an act directed to the Father. Meditation requires no church, no ideology and no go-between. Spirituality is the biggest threat to organized religion because of the private connection to God or source each person can develop. Back to Jesus, Brianna said. Is it possible that Jesus channeled from the Lord and spoke his words? Yes. The tougher question is whether you or I can perform the same miracle. You believe we can, Janet said. Kate didn't respond. Enter Mary, she said. The whore, right? Jennifer's sarcasm was obvious. Convenient for the disciples, isn't it? Kate said. She surveyed the women for reactions and continued. The Gospel of Mary suggests she was the first disciple. 
My belief is the disciples' betrayal of Mary was the beginning of the subjugation of women inside the church, which was replicated in towns and cities as a structure for society. Men in charge had the sole direct line to God. It takes a penis. Who said that, Jennifer said. Guilty, atheist here. Eileen Hall raised her hand. Religion was man's way to design the world in his image. Christ was a convenient model. Eileen was from New York and Senator Murray's aide. True, the church was central to society for a long time, Brianna said. Mary threatened Peter and the disciples because of her intimacy with Jesus. Kate paused. What if she met the eyes of each woman as she spoke? What if Mary's sight of the resurrection was a vision, something she channeled through prayer? Her face so sure, source spoke through her. You mean it wasn't physical, Brianna said? Mary didn't see the resurrection as I see you. It was, oh, I never thought about Jennifer's voice trailed off. Jesus prayed to be spared by God. Kate stopped. Have you said this to God when on your knees, when life breaks you in half? The specifics don't matter. Think about it. Kate's voice was low. The women leaned in, the room stilled. This journey began for me when I was young. It consumed me kept me alive. Then I had to face doubt when I took philosophy in college. It became the voyage of my life. Kate paused and took a sip from her water bottle. Mary Magdalene's story proves to me women's authentic role is to lead the faithful. Jesus needed her, and she became a closer confidant than his disciples. It was a miracle they found each other. In today's terms, they clicked, understood each other, and both interacted with the divine. It was their bond. Peter was jealous, Jennifer said. Maybe Mary was a revolutionary too. She wasn't written out of history. She witnessed it. A woman to verify Christ's story. It was too much for the disciples, said Tomeko, the aide to Senator Millie Tan. We must construct our own narrative and respond to how religious men wrote about women since Christ. They decided only men could talk to God. You all know the rest better than most, Kate said. Man's ego corrupted the church. His narcissism has led to the collapse of America's moral compass. Are you saying Mary's visions make her psychic? Alexandra said. Her her face blared doubt. (laughs) Kate broke into laughter. No, psychic ability is another topic. Phew, good, Jennifer said. The way men constructed the chapters of the Bible wrote women out, gave them disgraced biographies, or turned them into saints. But what was worse is they spoke of the quote-unquote miracles in these Bible stories as extraordinary and something outside human experience. Mary, quote-unquote, saw the resurrection as if it was a physical event she could film. Kate used air quotes and emphasized one word. If Mary had a vision, Jennifer's voice trailed off, the women stayed quiet. She hadn't finished speaking. So could we? Jennifer turned to Kate, who smiled back at her. I've never heard it stated so plainly, Janet said. Traditional folks consider my ideas blasphemous. I've heard it all from the patriarchal crowd. Change threatens a lot of people. To religious leaders and their alt-right supporters, losing their influence through women's equality is the ultimate threat, Kate said. It makes you the ultimate threat, Jennifer said. Exactly, Janet said. The room was quiet. When we disrespect adversaries like the alt-right, we ignore their influence. The women traded glances. 
Maybe if American women stand up and deliver a primal scream, people will pay attention. I had to do something but couldn't do it alone. This affects every woman in the country, their daughters and granddaughters, but we don't have enough of their stories. I want this to shock people awake. We're fighting to survive, Janet said. Kate's right. This is about religion, the church, and control, where men banded together and used traditional life to control women, Janet said. Kate smiled. Not enough men who run the world. Rewhite. You mean white men, Brianna smiled. Yes, I do. They didn't change after feminism, and white women gave them a pass. What about the psychic aspect of your meditations? I'm aware this is, this is tricky to explain, but Alexandra said. Kate's laughter set off nervous chuckles around the room. <laughs> when something rises out of my meditation, I never have awareness of where it will lead. Once I've connected to the message, there is no way to tell the outcome. But when I'm given something through a message from source, from God, I never doubt the compilation of information or puzzle pieces, puzzle pieces takes time to form a picture to follow. To answer your unspoken thoughts, yes, it can frighten, astound, and terrify. Energy is tonal. It requires respect when you tap into where your insti instincts want you to go. The pull can overwhelm you. Kate got quiet. It can also kill. The draw toward knowledge is placed in the center of an abyss. It takes a mystic with a magician's touch to unlock. So that's a bit from uh, Citizen Kate. Uh, all, my, all my books in this thriller series deal with visions. Uh, maybe Fatal was the first one, and that is uh, the most vision-centric. These are all very dark books with uh, uh, positive outcomes, but this is where I, a, I really prove that I know what the shadow side of, of humanity is. It is, my, um, it is my sweet spot. I have lived these experiences. I have survived them. I almost didn't, and I write about them. So these, these stories, I've, I've, I've jumped around in this snippet so this wouldn't last three hours, but it's long enough as it is. But this is uh, a lot about the shadow side because in order to really get in touch with your, with your authentic self and the ability to take in messages and get answers to questions, there is a lot of work with your own shadow side you must do, and we all have it. It is a common human uh, <laughs> trait. But uh, taking it one step further, remember your first vision or what you thought was a vision or the gut feeling you had to act, do something. Did you listen to it? This journey begins with our instincts, learning to listen and decipher them. But few can live by them. My journey for the last 20 plus years I'd say 30, I'd say my whole life I've lived by instincts. I've lived by an intuition, but it's the instinctual part. Um, it, it has changed my life, and it's changed our lives over the last 20 years. My husband was dragged into it because the power of what I excavated, uh, the gifts I have, couldn't be contained any longer. What I've experienced on this path was disruptive, life-altering, and shook my spiritual foundation that's been with me since I was a girl. There's no comfy place to start. The adventure I describe is disruptive. These energies that I talk about, the archetypal energies, are disruptive. This is part of evolution. Imagine, imagine, I want to take you back, imagine, Imagine a time without technology, over 2,000 years ago. You're in the desert near Jerusalem, Galilee. You're a woman. More specifically, imagine being Mary Magdalene. I know it's hard, but take the leap with me. What do you imagine ancient life would be like near Jerusalem? 
The sun is your only light. When darkness comes, it's total, a near blackout, except for the heavens and the stars above. A woman in ancient times had no freedom, rights, or future beyond her ability to marry and bear children. Mythology has Mary Magdalene a whore. People opine she must have been wealthy. She was the woman at Jesus' feet, but she wasn't. She lived in a village with no future but to marry. News spread through travelers, but one story swept the countryside in which she lived. A revolutionary named Jesus, a man of peace, talked of a different life with rumors of his presence spreading across the land. Mary Magdalene heard the rumors of the revolutionary who dared to challenge authority. Rome was on guard over his presence. In ancient times, at night when she prayed, where did her prayers in the dark of night with no hope for her own life lead her? This woman, who had no intention of marrying, who was pulled through her prayers toward the man everyone was talking about. The more she prayed, the drive within her to overcome her fear of what might happen should she follow her her inner voice. Intuition, a gut feeling. As her visions of Jesus filled in through prayer, she began to dream of her life in a new way. This connection is the gateway to real magic and authentic life. It's as old as Christianity Christianity itself, the gateway. But the power doesn't lie outside. It's inside each of us. I'm not an astrologer. I am no empath. I've traversed the dark shadows and deep blackness of the human psyche to not only survive but thrive, crashed through a portal and landed amid great mysteries. It begins for me with Mary Magdalene. Her prayers created a miracle connection, but it took personal desperation to force her to break through her fears. Death waited for her at the hands of her own father should she be caught fleeing her family. Nothing could stop Mary Magdalene from finding the revolutionary named Christ. Mary Magdalene fled to, the, to find the man whose myth had invaded her thoughts and prayers. When they met, lightning struck. Across a crowded marketplace, she felt him nearby. Mary recognized him at first sight. The man we know as Jesus had the same reaction to her. His disciples had become demanding, petty, and Jesus sensed they wanted more from him to feed their ego. Mary Magdalene's presence offered something his disciples could not. Mary had sacrificed everything to find him risked her life to follow Jesus, and she wanted nothing in return but to serve him. It's about spiritual connection, miracles, and the courage required to trust instincts and intuition, our visions over ego. Beware of seeking others' good opinion. Practice and keep your own counsel. There is reward Disruption is part of the process, but so is great wisdom. I couldn't embrace my own gifts, understand the violence and tortured existence of my youth until I understood the mythology of women across history and the first person who grabbed my imagination, Mary Magdalene, a woman who was vilified for centuries to prove only men are deemed worthy to talk directly to God. It wasn't until the 21st century that she was hailed as, quote, apostle to the apostles. Next week is Lilith, a legendary woman who's as misunderstood as Mary Magdalene, but remains demonized through mythology about a single point where she exists. Oh my gosh, you won't want to miss it. I'm Taylor Marsh, and this is Astral Soul Lightning. 
You can find me on social media. I do my politics on Twitter at, at Taylor Marsh, and my full bio is on Amazon. Email me at soul.astral.lightning at gmail.com. Thanks for listening. I so appreciate it.